grand rounds, and I think we are in for a real treat today. Peter Wilson is going to be here with his team. And they're going to be talking, as Peter usually is talking on metabolism or diabetes or lipids, uh, and I'm sure he'll probably hit all of these. Peter had developed uh, his interest in medicine, I guess, back in the 1970s when he started out at med school at the University of Texas in San Antonio, and then went from there to Duke and was at Duke, and then and part of his career, which he probably got the most accolades for, was when he was director of laboratories at uh, Framingham Heart Center. So he comes to us with a lot of knowledge. Uh, the thing I looked through and tried to see with, with Peter, I think the biggest thing I saw was the award you got in, in 2017 that was kind of for people that have made a contribution to medicine that goes back and, and people can look at this contribution and say, that person saved a lot of lives for what they did. And I thought that was an impressive honor that you got there. The other thing I can speak for Peter is if you have time on your hands, and particularly if you're out of town, and Peter's got some time on his hands and out of town, you've got a couple of beers, then it's for an entertaining and very enlightening uh, discussion. So I would recommend that if you ever get the chance. Uh, but glad to have you, Peter. <laughs> We're going to cut Dr. Morris off before he embarrasses both of us. Uh, so what can I say? I read The Economist. I think that's one of the reasons I have more information than many people. So uh, we have a three-part show today, and we're going to have three cases. Um, I'm largely responsible for most of these cases, but uh, the second one's especially been adapted. Uh, and they're, it's targeted towards an internal medicine physician uh, what's happening for diabetes care, and tough questions. So we mostly are asking ourselves the questions as we go through and then attempting to answer them as well. We have no relations with industry, and we have th the three cases are related to outpatient, chest pain in the ED, and then a heart failure. Okay. So outpatient. I'm not going to read every word on these cases. I'm just going to go through the highlights as you can see. So this is a typical diabetic patient who would be seen at any of our Emory hospitals. He's on metformin. His glucose is pretty good. His A1C is not at his target of seven. Uh, for blood pressure, he has mild hypertension. He's taking chlorothaldone. His on-treatment uh, numbers are pretty good. He's following ADA recommendations to have home monitoring. His cholesterol, he has a diet that's uh, reasonable. He's on low-dose atorvastatin. His LDL is currently is 105. His 10-year risk is 8.8% uh, for this patient. He's heavy, over uh, 30 uh, kilograms per meter squared. His creatinine has uh, got mildly decreased uh, EGFR with that calculation. He was checked with a casual specimen, which is part of the annual checkups for diabetics. And he has 40 milligrams per gram of creatinine in a casual specimen, no retinopathy. Uh, no MI, no, no vascular disease. Physical exam, really pretty normal. Uh, you see real quick uh, and a normal foot exam. So now, just I'm not going to read all of these, but it's basically when you have a diabetic patient after you've done your history and physical, you go through the standard traditional risk factors and you add a couple others because they're, it's a diabetic patient. So you go through glucose, blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, kidney function, and vascular disease risk, all right? So um, what do we wanna do? And then you open the book, and if you are a, a medical student, you say, oh my goodness, there are more medicines for to treat diabetes than I can begin to grab onto. I just don't know where to start. And you're no different really as a medical student than you are as a third year resident in most of our training programs because the number of medicines, we started out originally with sulfonylureas. They really might've caused heart disease. We still think that today. We moved to metformin as the second generation of uh, biguanide. And now we've moved on to add more and more intestinal uh, fat inhibitors. Those don't work very well. Uh, in cretins, which work to boost the insulin effects, and there are two varieties of those, the, the gliptins and the tides, for instance, uh, some are injectable. Some of the injectables just became oral only in the last few months, which may be a game changer for how those insulin boosters are, are going to work. And then the most recent one, the SGLT2s, and you say, oh my goodness, how do I remember that one? So sodium glucose inhibitors 
working in the kidney to make the patient spill glucose more at 150 milligrams per deciliter rather than at a 200 to 250 range, which is your historical uh, tubular max. So you have all these choices, and then if these don't work or combinations don't work, you have insulins. Uh, we're not going to talk about that, but you should have familiarity with the oral medicines. Now, rapidly going through what is out there. Thiazolidine dions were extremely popular until about 10, 15 years ago. And this was a game-changing meta-analysis by Steve Nissen and colleagues. And as you can see, highlighted there for myocardial infarction and CVD death, an increased signal for you should not use these because this really may increase your risk. And that was followed by more meta-analyses. Uh, there was such concern, was this really done right? And the other meta-analyses uh, really did not necessarily corroborate all the same information. So for CBD death risk, as you can see, the diamonds uh, crossed the null effect. So it did not increase CBD death uh, on increased analysis, but it did increase heart failure. So now we have a black box. We've had that for at least a decade. Do not use thiazolidine dions for patients with heart failure or at high risk to develop heart failure. Next. Well, glucose is lower. You know, we should really lower glucose. The lower is better. But as uh, physicians know, it, the more aggressive you get, you may have hypoglycemia. You may have undetected hypoglycemia. And unfortunately, in the ACCORD trial, this was a more than 50, probably a $100 million NIH trial, they found that individuals who had the more intensive care, as you can see there, intensive versus usual care, you have an increased relative risk for early death. This was a trial that the glucose arm was stopped early because of adverse outcomes of death. Uh, the, unfortunately, the other arms of this trial, the lipid arm for fibrates and the other arm uh, for blood pressure were also no. Now, this is one of those conceptual slides that endocrinologists and most physicians use, but they don't know how to actually verbalize, is I do different things for different patients. And one of the rules of thumb is the, the longer you think your patient's going to live, the more you can feel you can be aggressive, well, go ahead and do it. But don't use the same numbers for cutoffs for treatment for all patients. So to give an example, uh, what would you have that A1C of seven? I remember I said that in the, in the case, that patient has a target of seven. No, well, if he was 80 years old or 90 years old, should you have a target of seven because of the ACCORD trial? So you would relax that. And the same might be for a patient for hypertension. So you relax what are your targets. And that is, other than conceptualization, that's all that you'll really find in the American Diabetes Association annual uh, guidelines uh, for what to do. Now, the newer medicines, you're going to hear some more about this from uh, Dr. Gupta, but just to lead off a little bit, uh, what about these newer medicines? Why are they out there? Why did they come along? So here are the gliptins, which are uh, these new in, newer in cretins, and they started out with the signals you can see there for heart failure. These were safety studies because of the thiazolidine dione story. And by the time we got to the th third or fourth medicine, it evaporated. So there was great safety. So these drugs are being used more and more. Unfortunately, they're not as potent as we'd like to see, but they are safe. What about hypertension? I just said that, you know, we would relax that. But in more recently, there's been a tightening up for some patients. Uh, for instance, for our patients, well, what is his target? Should it be 140 over 90 or 130 over 80? Does it matter? Uh, analyses like that are being done uh, following the 2018 uh, blood pressure guidelines that came out from ACC and AHA. And albuminuria, this is something that most physicians don't check. Endocrinologists are obligated to check it because it's part of diabetes every year care. So it should be screened. 30, greater than 30 milligrams per gram qualifies as what's called microalbuminuria. Enough albuminuria that you should pay attention and you should include an ACE or an ARB in the medication plan. And then as you can see here, it, it typically takes three medications to control blood pressure for a diabetic don't always expect to get there with one. So you've got to be more aggressive than usual. And then quickly, I'm going to run through these others. All these other drugs, the tides are injectable drugs. 
and they are ex especially good for weight loss. Liraglutide has been the leader. We have several others in that class. They're all, I want to say, almost equally effective, and the, and the costs are, are coming down because of the competition. And then most recently, these SGLTs, which all end in gliflozin. And one of the way you can remember gliflozin is it's a, urine, a drug that's working on the urinary system and you have glucose and it's flozin. I tell them, just imagine that. That'll help you remember these different names because there, there are a lot of polysyllabic uh, num names for these drugs. But EMPA, as you can see there, uh, not only did it, uh, it save lives, it also probably reduced heart failure. And you're going to hear more about that from Dr. Gupta. Other ones, canagal flows and same sort of thing. We're, and we have others as well. One of the others that came, question that came up is how low to go in terms of kidney function. These drugs are especially working for patients uh, who have great kidney function. But if you have reduced kidney function, can you still get the glucose lowering without side effects? And the answer is generally yes. The one pearl that I say to most uh, physicians, if you're going to prescribe a gliflozin to a patient, because you can get increased urinary infections, increased vaginal infections, fungal infections, do not prescribe them to people who are sedentary or are totally at bed rest, because you, you really may get into trouble with severe infections in that case. Same thing, more recent one with a declared trial uh, with dapagliflozin. So here's my advice, and I'm going to end, and we're going to turn it over. What are we going to do with our patient? So our A1C, just read the second line for each one, tighter control, more treatments, many options. So, and if you don't feel comfortable as a clinician, get an endocrine consult, even just to help you provide some guidance. Remember, our patient had more than 30 milligrams per gram, so he had, she, he had a microalbuminuria, so add an ACE. And then you're now going to have an ACE plus a thiazide. You might drop back on the thiazide even or go to a lower dose or stop it. LDL cholesterol, this patient classically undertreated, 10 milligrams of atorva. If you go through the recent ADA or ACC guidelines, he should be on 40 to 80 milligrams a day, high intensity. Patients obese, potentially uh, put this patient on liraglutide or another medication. The vascular risk actually was wrong in the chart. His, his risk is 25%. Calculate the risk yourself using the 2018 uh, calculator. And this patient doesn't need to be screened. Just follow and have, go into an ASCVD prevention program. So next up is Dr. Goyle, and he's going to take, I guess, another diabetic patient in an uh, Emory Hospital e emergency department. And what are the challenges there in 2019? Abby? Right. Thank you, uh, Peter, for that introduction and for the opportunity to present uh, this case. Um, I thought Peter had a very interesting concept of trying to make this these case-based, where to really just emphasize the aspects of care of these patients rather than just give a purely didactic lecture so we can put it in the context of how we care for patients. So I'll give one that's focused on chest pain uh, before Dr. Gupta gives one that's focused on heart failure. Uh, so this is an actual case that presented about a year ago to our hospital. And I try and pick cases that are actual patients that have presented uh, because it just helped me remember a lot of the salient details. This was a 64-year-old woman with CKD, a baseline creatinine of 1.8, with hypertension managed on two drugs, a known cerebral aneurysm that had not been previously treated. It was being monitored. It was deemed stable. Uh, no known diabetes, and she was also Jehovah's Witness. She presented with eight out of 10 chest discomfort on her left side while shopping, and 911 was called. Her blood pressure in the field was 226 over 122 millimeters of mercury, and the paramedics gave her an aspirin and one sublingual nitroglycerin. When she arrived at the outside hospital, she appeared uncomfortable. Her heart rate was 78. Uh, her blood pressure was 218 over 107, not much of a drop after the sublingual nitroglycerin given to her. She was oxygenating at 95% on room air, and the, the record indicated that she had an otherwise unremarkable exam with no clinical signs of heart failure at the time. In the ED, they did serial ECGs that showed dynamic T-wave changes in the inferior leads. Her initial troponin was negative, but then four hours later, it went up to 0 
the glucose on admission was 280 milligrams per deciliter, A1C was 8.5, and her creatinine was 2.4, up from a baseline of 1.8. This was a, uh, a, a woman who said that she was not aware that she had diabetes before coming in. So the ED at the Southside Hospital initiated treatment for a presumptive diagnosis of an NSTEMI, and a heparin drip was started, and nitroglycerin drip was started, and she was transferred to the ICU. Now, in the course of this case, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's a lot that you can unpack from this case. I'm going to focus on three clinical questions and try and go into them a little more in depth as opposed to try and answer a ton of things. I thought we'd pick three questions that would be of interest. Um, the first, which is uh, near and dear to my heart, which I've sort of been uh, proselytizing, I'll be honest about it, is the correct diagnosis of whether this patient's truly having an, uh, an NSTEMI or not. Is an acute NSTEMI the correct di diagnosis? Should this patient have been managed with IV heparin? So what do we have here? We have a, a woman with several risk factors who comes in with chest pain, a good story, very hypertensive. She does have dynamic T wave changes on an ECG and her troponin initially negative does bump up to 0.53. All right, so you have symptoms, you have dynamic ECG changes and you have a troponin bump, all right? This is the first of two slides that, that um, we have disseminated across Emory Healthcare uh, over the past year. This and the next slide, which I show, I have about 50 copies of these made. They're outside in the back uh, where the house staff pick up their lunches. So you're welcome to pick these up on, on the way out. But this first box is a rise and fall in serial troponin testing. If you see that, that does not automatically mean the patient's having a myocardial infarction, okay? Let me repeat that. If you see a rise and fall of troponin, that does not automatically mean the patient's having a myocardial infarction. What does troponin elevation mean? It simply means that there is some injury to the heart muscle. It doesn't indicate that the mechanism of that injury is ischemic in nature or that patient had an infarction in particular. To diagnose an MI, the troponin elevation is insufficient. You also have to have either clinical symptoms of acute ischemia and or objective evidence on ECG or other imaging tests documenting ischemia. That ancillary evidence of ischemia is critical to diagnose an MI in conjunction with the troponin rise and fall. If you do not have evidence of ischemia by symptoms or by ECG or imaging, that would be called a non-MI troponin elevation secondary to another cause. There are a number of things that do that. Acute PE is considered a non-MI troponin elevation. Acute pericarditis, myocarditis, uh, sepsis without shock, uh, Takasubo cardiomyopathy. A lot, um, if you have a defibrillator shock in the absence of ischemia from scar-based ventricular tachycardia, all of these things cause direct injury to the muscle without uh, implicating an ischemic mechanism or a drop in blood flow or oxygenation down the coronaries to implicate that. So these are non-MI troponin elevation. Our patient here did have symptoms of ischemia. She presented with chest pain. She did have dynamic ECG changes. So it's fair to say she had an acute myocardial infarction, but we're not done. You have to ask now, what is the type of MI that this patient had? Would you really call it a type one myocardial infarction, which is due to an acute coronary artery thrombosis, which would make it a STEMI. You would usually see ST elevation on the ECG, which we did not in this case, or an acute coronary artery plaque rupture, which would make it a type one and STEMI. Or does the clinical context support more myocardial oxygen supply demand mismatch, which would make it a type 2 MI secondary to an underlying cause? Okay, and in this case, um, one could argue that she came in markedly hypertensive, so it's very possible this was a type 2 MI secondary to a hypertensive emergency. Okay, at any rate, one could argue that heparin, IV heparin, which was restarted reflexively in this patient because they automatically equated a troponin elevation with an end STEMI due to plaque rupture, one, should argue, one could argue that should not have been started, particularly given the hypertensive emergency where it's a relative contraindication to start heparin and the presence of a cerebral aneurysm. You would really only want to start heparin if you thought this was a clear, a pretty clear end STEMI. And, and the data on heparin are actually quite old. For upstream IV heparin prior uh, in patients with end STEMI, it's fairly old. These are data that predate 
are very sensitive biomarkers. They predate um, Plavix and other P2Y12 antagonists. They predate the early invasive strategy. And there's a group that is sort of lobbying to have uh, upstream IB heparin removed from um, the NSTEMI guidelines because it's kind of an outdated um, guideline. All right. So I would argue, and then this is the second uh, grid that is also available in the back. I don't have time to go over this in detail. We do give this lecture to house staff every year and I should get on your calendar soon for the, for the medical residents to do this soon. Um, the types of categories of MI, uh, of, uh, you know, of troponin elevation, a STEMI usually diagnosed fairly quickly based on the ECG. In this case, we're debating between a type one N STEMI and a type two MI and then the non-MI troponin elevation. For completion, we do have other types of MI, type 3 MI from sudden cardiac death before biomarkers can be drawn, type 4 MI from PCI, type 5 MI from cabbage. These will rarely be documented by non-cardiology services. For, your, for, for most of our purposes, if you can remember these four buckets, I think that'd be great. And here, it's important, not just from a semantic standpoint, but from how you treat the patient. If you start a type 2 MI patient with heparin, invasive cath, et cetera, you put them at real risk of bleeding. The recommended treatment for a type 2 MI is treat the underlying cause. You don't go after them like they have an acute plaque rupture, okay? Uh, in this case, there's a high enough suspicion that it could be hypertension related. It would be totally appropriate to not load them with heparin and plavix and probably the safer thing to do. Cardiology will not fault you for, for not starting IV heparin or Plavix upstream if the, question, if the diagnosis of NSTEMI is in doubt. However, um, uh, I have seen enough cases reviewing over hundreds of these cases now in the past uh, 24 months where we really can cause harm by starting upstream NSTEMI when the diagnosis is not clearly an NSTEMI to begin with, okay? So let's look at the rest of the, the course here. Um, uh, so at the outside hospital, this patient developed headache, nausea, and vomiting, and a stat head CT was obtained because they were concerned about the history of the aneurysm, and it actually came back worrisome for subarachnoid hemorrhage based on a hyperdensity in the sylvia and fissure, okay? IV heparin and IV nitroglycerin was stopped, and they were concerned enough about the possibility of bleed that they actually even gave IV protamine. The troponin peaked at around 11. And then the patient was transferred to the neuro ICU at EUH from the outside hospital. They got a cerebral angiogram diagnosing an aneurysm of four by nine millimeters. It was actually smaller than on prior imaging. The MRI of the brain thankfully showed no subarachnoid hemorrhage. It was an artifact on the head CT. And neurosurgery said, this is an unruptured aneurysm. We don't wanna deal with it right now. We'll walk away, you deal with the MI. Thank you, see you later, all right? And that's what happened with regards to the aneurysm. So the patient was transferred to our service in cardiology to focus on the MI. An echo was obtained, EF 50%, with apical septal, apical inferior, apical hypokinesis, and a decision was made to cath the patient without a prior stress test. Now, it's probably not unreasonable that this patient went to cath uh, because, you know, the troponin bumped to 10 and uh, you know there was a real concern about the diagnosis. I, I do want to make a comment here. It also would not have been unreasonable to stress the patient from the standpoint that the cre patient's creatinine was 2.4, the baseline was 1.8. Uh, you know they wanted it to go down. It never really went below 2.2. The other thing is some might argue well the stress test is going to be positive. It might be positive, but sometimes you're not looking to determine positive or negative. You're looking to determine whether it's high risk or low risk in terms of its features to determine how quickly you need to diagnose and go after the coronary arteries, okay? We have a sense of urgency often that if you see the troponin go up, you have to diagnose and manage and revascularize immediately. And what we're learning is these patients are complex. And, and sometimes it's good to say, well, if they're not having a clear and STEMI or acute coronary syndrome, you can step back and say, you know what, if they're stable, if we can get them stable on blood pressure medicines and they don't have a high risk scan, maybe we can defer the cath to later. In this case, the decision was made to go ahead and cath the patient, okay? These are tools still, two still shots from the angiogram. All right, so this is an injection of the left coronary artery system. This is the catheter uh, engaging the left main coronary artery. This is a, a cranial view with the LED coming down and the circumflex and branches going uh, off to the side here. And what you can appreciate 
highlighted by this yellow arrow is a tight lesion in the distal left main coronary artery that's about 60% stenosed, okay? On this other shot, the right coronary artery was engaged. And here, what you can see is at the bifurcation where it bifurcates to the posterior descending artery, which is, uh, in this case, this is a right dominant patient, which about 85% of patients or so are. Um, the PDA branch is what supplies the inferior wall. You see about a 75% stenosis of the proximal PDA. So distal left main 60%, proximal right PDA 75%. This, by definition, is called surgical coronary anatomy if you have more than a 50% left main coronary uh, lesion because this limits supply both down the le L left anterior descending coronary artery and down the left circumflex coronary artery. Importantly, they identified no acute coronary artery plaque rupture. Now, I really try to stress to our interventional cardiology colleagues that a lot of us really hang on how they write their reports. And, and I will admit, we in cardiology are sometimes guilty of, of not being complete in our reporting where really we should help determine the diagnosis of whether this was a plaque rupture MI or a different MI type. And our cath guys don't routinely do that. And that's something we are trying to change. It's like hurting cats, but you know, we, we do it. We're, we're, we're gonna keep hurting cats until the cats are herded, okay? The LVEDP was nine, which is considered within uh, normal limits. So there was no evidence of volume overload. So let's go back to the initial question. Is NSTEMI the correct diagnosis? The overall clinical context and the cath findings do not support a type one NSTEMI because there was no evidence of, of uh, acute coronary artery plaque rupture. The most appropriate diagnosis here is a type two MI, secondary to hypertensive urgency, emergency, in the setting of fixed obstructive coronary disease. There is real coronary disease, there is surgical coronary disease, but it did not cause a type one NSTEMI due to acute plaque rupture. The correct management here would have been to treat the underlying cause, the hypertensive emergency. IV heparin should not have been given in this case. In this case, the potential harm outweighed the benefits. All right, just another uh, quick thing. Hypertensive emergency is the correct name here. Hypertensive urgency is not accepted in documentation. Again, emergency is the correct term or crisis is the correct term. We don't like to see the term hypertensive urgency because this patient had target organ damage with at least two systems involved, the type 2 MI and the acute kidney injury on top of the CKD. Okay, that makes it emergency. It's not just urgency, all right? So question two, moving to the next question, because this is also a diabetes talk, how aggressively should this patient's hyperglycemia be treated in the ICU? Uh, just uh, to recall, this patient previously was not known to have diabetes. She presented with an admission glucose of 280 milligrams per deciliter with an A1C of 8.5, all right? So um, we, uh, this is the first of two sort of data slides. There is a U-shaped relationship we know between admission glucose and death in acute MI patients. These are data that um, uh, I analyzed as a fellow um, before coming to Emory from a, a large acute MI data set. And this demonstrates a U-shaped relationship, both hypoglycemia um, below 80 and hyperglycemia uh, you know, above 110, 120 are associated with, with uh, adverse outcomes, including death following acute myocardial infarction, okay? So this is a U-shaped relationship. Our patient had a glucose of around 280, which would put her about 16%, which would make it about three times, you know, the mortality, associated mortality risk of someone who came in with a more normal glucose level. That's a high mortality risk. This begs the question, of course, does treating that hyperglycemia aggressively improve the patient's outcome? That's a completely different question. This is association. That doesn't necessarily mean this, this is a causal relationship. So there have been a number of studies that have looked at the um, potential benefit of intensive insulin therapy to lower glucose and see whether it improves outcomes. The first was published by Vandenberg and colleagues in the surgical ICU setting in a single center in Belgium. And this small study basically shook the landscape uh, and demonstrated a mortality benefit for intensive insulin therapy targeting 80 to 110 milligram per deciliter compared with conventional glucose control. And it changed a lot of performance measures. It changed uh, inappropriately based on a single center trial. It really changed guidelines 
I think because people were excited to see something that worked. But then a series of studies came after that, including Vandenberg trying to replicate it in medical ICUs, in mixed surgical medical ICUs, demonstrating no benefit of intensive insulin therapy compared with conventional glucose control. The largest of this was the NICE sugar stu study of about 6,000 patients, mixed medical and surgical ICU patients. This is a meta-analysis that was published in 2011, looking at all of these trials. A quick word on meta-analyses. The highlight figure from the meta-analysis is called a forest plot. And in a forest plot, they line up the studies and you can see different size boxes here, okay? The larger the box, it indicates that that trial had the larger number of events compared with other trials. So more events indicates a larger box, okay? Wide confidence intervals is usually associated with a very small box and uncertainty. The larger boxes you'll notice have very small confidence limits because there's more certainty around the estimates. A meta-analysis will take like trials and then synthesize here indicating that overall there was no benefit for intensive insulin therapy compared with uh, um, conventional glucose control, no difference in mortality, length of stay, infection, or renal replacement therapy, but there was a six-fold higher rate of severe hypoglycemia. And on this basis, the AHA, American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, and the American College of Endocrinology all recommend a glucose target now of 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter, a more lenient target as opposed to the aggressive 80 to 110. Okay, so in answer to the second question, for most critically ill patients with persistent hyperglycemia, insulin therapy is recommended when the glucose is above 180 just to achieve a target of 140 to 180. We do not have to shoot for more stringent targets. It's associated with more hypoglycemia and not better outcomes. For non-critically ill patients, um, the endocrinology guidelines suggest shooting for a pre-meal glucose of less than 140. That includes your fasting morning glucose and random glucose less than 180. All right. Now we'll address the third and final question of this case. What is the optimal revascularization strategy in this patient? All right. We'll go over here again to the coronary angiography findings. I already mentioned that this is the equivalent of three vessel coronary disease or surgical coronary disease where you have a tight left main lesion, um, which indicates diminished flow down both the LAD and left circumflex territories, as well as a tight right coronary artery lesion or PDA lesion. And um, you could give a grand rounds just solely on this one question. Um, to try and put it in a nutshell in the remaining three minutes that I have, um, we basically have three revascularization options in this patient. The first is to do a traditional cabbage, traditional coronary artery bypass graft uh, operation where you do a median sternotomy and you do an open cabbage. You essentially do a median sternotomy, you tack uh, um, an internal mammary or internal thoracic artery to the distal LED. Some guidelines would suggest a second um, uh, either radial artery or the right internal thoracic artery to another uh, segment, and then other arterial or vein grafts to other targets as needed. So the open cabbage is one option. That's typically associated with the most upfront morbidity, a sternotomy, you know, as we take it for granted, but it's like getting hit with a truck to recover from that. And it's not a small thing, okay? The second approach would be to do multi-vessel PCI in this patient where you would go after a distal left main. Uh, we would call that an unprotected left main because this patient has not had previous cabbage. Uh, no lima graft to protect the left main in case that gets complicated and closes down during the PCI. But you could go after that as well as a PDA lesion. All right. The third option is to do what we call a hybrid approach where you do a minimally invasive cabbage, where you do a thoracotomy, not a midline uh, sternotomy, but a thoracotomy uh, where, and then you use a robot to try and actually dissect the um, left internal mammary artery and then tack it down using a robot to the distal LED territory. And then for any other lesions, you do PCI in this patient, all right? So first of all, this is not anatomy that is suitable to the hybrid approach. The reason being is because if you tack down a lima to the distal LAD, it would still leave the left circumflex territory unrevascularized since the issue is in the distal left main. It's not like you have a proximal LED lesion. 
you have a left main lesion that would leave the whole left circumflex territory unrevascularized. So this is a case and, uh, where the surgeons determined it's not appropriate for um, uh, a minimally invasive cabbage or hybrid approach. Uh, next, the multivessel PCI. I think uh, many of you may recall the, the teaching that uh, multivessel multi coronary disease in a diabetes patient uh, cabbage is considered superior. That is data that is 10, 15 years old. The question is, does that data still uh, hold up? And the short answer is yes. Okay, even still today in today's day and age, cabbage is superior to PCI for patients with multivessel CAD and diabetes. Uh, this is the most recent um, uh, synthesis of this data. This was an 11 trial meta-analysis published in the Lancet. Uh, this was an individual patient level meta-analysis of 11 trials. The largest of these trials is the Freedom Trial that was published, I think, two years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine with 1,900 patients, all with diabetes, all with surgical coronary disease, randomized to cabbage versus PCI, in conjunction with 10 other studies that looked at this um, question that had an adequate uh, diabetes subpopulation. So this is a meta-analysis of about 4,400 diabetes patients that shows a clear five-year mortality benefit for cabbage versus PCI in the diabetes group, 10% versus 16%. For those cardiology enthusiasts in the room, there's, there are other trials, including the syntax trial looking at cabbage versus PCI that suggests that perhaps for less complex anatomy, you could go for PCI. It's important to note in the diabetes population uh, in this meta-analysis, the benefit for cabbage was greater than that for PCI in all, all of the strata of syntax scores, whether it was low, intermediate, or high risk syntax scores. And um, this is a clearly the, still the, the option of choice in this patient where cabbage is better than PCI. Uh, Peter did want me to mention the Berry 2D trial, which was now an older trial that looked at revascularization strategies in patients with diabetes. That was a trial that was initially designed to look at revascularization by any approach versus revascularization plus medical therapy. It was not specifically a PCI versus cabbage trial, okay? And so that's why that, I didn't mention that as being included in this meta-analysis. But if you look back at the Berry 2D data in the strata of patients who underwent cabbage, cabbage was better than um, just medical therapy alone. It did not compare cabbage versus PCI as those patients had already been selected for the operation they wanted to undergo. So for this third question, the answer here is that open cabbage is the preferred and superior approach if the patient's amenable uh, instead of multi-vessel PCI or even hybrid cabbage PCI. In this patient, open cabbage was performed during the same encounter. I do want to mention that our surgical colleagues are, are being a lot more judicious now about whether these kind of operations need to be done on the same encounter. I'm going to argue that even though this patient presented with a type 2 MI, it does not constitute an emergency to revascularize the patient because it was driven by their hypertensive emergency, which we can treat medically and then deal with the revasc afterward. This is not an acute plaque rupture MI. That's why the diagnosis of the type of MI is so important. If you really thought that we're having a plaque rupture MI with an unstable plaque that was untreated, that might force your hand to say, we need to treat the, the MI sooner. This was a type 2 MI driven by hypertensive emergency that you could treat medically. This was also a patient who had anemia with a hemoglobin of 10 and a Jehovah's Witness. I would, be, I would not be surprised if our surgical colleagues said, we want them to go home, take plenty of iron, buff up their iron stores, improve their hemoglobin, and then bring them back for an elective cabbage where we have more control over the risk factors and everything going in before we go after um, the cabbage in this particular patient. Okay, but the, the proper strategy in this case was an open cabbage as was done in this patient. This patient got three grafts, a lima to the LAD, um, a vein graft to the uh, PDA, and a vein graft to the circumflex as well. Okay, so that's the chest pain case. Um, all right, uh, I'm sorry, and that's what I meant to read here. The open cabbage was preferred. So now I'd like to introduce for the third case, Dr. Divya Gupta. She's an associate professor of medicine, and she's um, uh, recently been appointed as our medical director for heart failure and transplantation cardiology for, um, for um, the division of cardiology across the system. And she's been uh, tremendous as an educator, as a clinician, and as a quality improvement specialist. And we're 
lucky to have her help us think through these issues in the third case. Okay, Divya. I'm gonna bring this mic down a little bit to my level. Um, so we will start talking about heart failure and diabetes. Uh, so if you have a 55 year old retired Caucasian male who has type two diabetes for the last 10 years, he does not smoke, he does follow with endocrinology and cardiology. Um, and he has spent about eight days in the hospital six months ago for uh, what looks to be heart failure with which he was diaries 20 pounds. As you guys, if you've ever rotated on our service, that's like small potatoes compared to some of the 50 pound diuresis patients we get sometimes. So this patient's outpatient echo had an EF of 35%, which was done about two months ago, and he can go about 30 feet and then needs to stop because he gets short of breath and is having a lot of dyspnea. He has gained 20 pounds over the past month, uh, currently at 230, and he sleeps on two pillows. Um, no recent chest pain issues. Um, and he does monitor his blood pressure at home and almost always it runs uh, less than 140 over 90. He takes his lisinopril uh, for hypertension. He is on Lasix 80 milligrams daily for uh, maintaining euvolemia or in an attempt to maintain euvolemia, as well as Carvedilol 12 and a half. He seems to be taking a glyptin uh, 10 milligrams per day. He's on metformin. His recent A1C is about 7.3 and he's not had any issues with hypoglycemia. He is taking his atorvastatin with his recent LDL of 50, HDL of 40, and triglycerides of 50. Um, his creatinine is about 1.5 with a GFR of 60. Uh, his eye exam is fine. He has no real vascular disease. Um, and on physical exam, his blood pressure actually looks pretty good. It's 110 over 80 with a pulse of 110 and regular. He's breathing about 20 a minute and afebrile. He does weigh 230. Nothing on his uh, cardiovascular exam, it appears here. Maybe some mild rails in his lungs. He does have an obese abdomen, but no organomegaly. He's got some one plus pitting edema in his feet bilaterally. Um, his EKG is unremarkable. He is a little bit tachycardic though. Uh, his portable x-ray shows an enlarged heart, some evidence of pulmonary congestion, but no effusion. Um, his labs show the creatinine of 1.8, glucose of 110, and potassium 4, otherwise very unremarkable. So the big things I want to hit on here is, so what is the importance of heart failure and diabetes and what is this connection here? Um, so really this is um, a very important fact to understand that diabetes is, a, uh, is an exacerbator of heart failure to some extent. Men um, are two times, uh, with diabetes, have a two times higher risk of developing heart failure. Women uh, with diabetes at, are at a five times higher risk of developing heart failure. So there is this huge connection here between diabetes and heart failure. 44% uh, of patients that are hospitalized with heart failure will have a diagnosis of diabetes. So uh, we should all get better at managing diabetes because no matter what area of uh, medicine we end up practicing, I can guarantee you, you will come in contact with patients that have heart failure and that have diabetes, and a good portion of them are going to carry both diagnoses. So a little bit about how to manage these patients. So the big thing I think to really know, and Dr. Wilson really um, uh, uh, really discussed this, is what we really need to avoid, and really avoiding the DPP-4s in patients with heart failure uh, is very important, and the TZDs as well. So the big thing about the DPP-4s, why are these so bad? So there's this thought that these medications actually lead to uh, an issue with increased cardiac fibrosis. And that fibrosis is really a big part of what causes heart failure exacerbations, no matter what the etiology, whether it be ischemic in nature, whether it be non-ischemic in nature, um, whether it be genetic, there is this component of increased myocardial fibrosis that is very involved with causing that dysfunction to the myocardium um, that then leads to this development of heart failure. For the TZDs, you know, we really don't have a great understanding of how it causes this increased edema, but it's really believed that it leads to a reduction in sodium uh, excretion. And so then we hold on to this sodium and this water and it causes all of this fluid retention. So for these reasons, these medications really should be avoided. Uh, with the TZDs, that edema actually can even be associated in patients that don't have heart failure. And I can tell you um, from family experience, my own father-in-law uh, was taking a TZD, no diagnosis of heart failure, starts having edema. So he asks me, what should I do? And I was like, change your medication. And now you know he's doing great. So this is actually true whether a patient has heart failure or not. 
Um, the other big thing that I think is very exciting is this is the latest and greatest that just came out a few weeks ago, the DAPA HF trial using one of the glyphosones, which I will always remember now as glucose flowing, flows in, right? Uh, and I think I said that correctly, Dr. Wilson, please correct me. The, the plagoflazone, I can't remember. The pagliflazone, all right, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, this actually shows improvement in heart failure outcomes, irrespective of the heart failure patient with reduced ejection fraction has diabetes. So the use of this medication and a little bit more, um, a few more trials are coming down the road with the use of this drug, but really something that is helping to improve outcomes for our heart failure patients. We had a long span there of about 20 years where there was really nothing new or great coming out. And now, you know, like recently we had uh, Valsartan Secubitril that came out and now potentially this benefit for diabetic or not, but heart failure patients with reduced DF um, and um, helping to manage not only volume with the use of this medication, but also mortality outcomes. So how does the SGLT2 inhibitor actually help us? So it actually aids in this downstream increase in glucosuria. So you're supposed to reabsorb a lot of this glucose here um, in the proximal tubule. And in this case, we actually don't reabsorb all that. So all of that gets urinated out. And I think Dr. Wilson talked about that uh, a lot in a lot more detail. So now switching gears a little bit, really about management of heart failure. And so a big thing that I wanted to really touch on is we really, I think this idea of using the BNP to figure out, does this patient really have heart failure? What is the utility of this in managing our heart failure patients? So a big thing to really know is you can have elevated BNPs for a lot of different reasons that are not associated with heart failure. Some of these cardiac, some of these non-cardiac. Um, troponin elevations can be, or sorry, no, troponin, excuse me, PEs can be associated with eleva elevated BNPs. A valvular disease without actually having issues of heart failure can be associated with this. MIs also can have elevated BNPs without um, any issues of um, volume overload or heart failure symptoms. Things such as advancing age, anemia, renal failure, um, bacterial sepsis are also all associated with elevated BNP levels. So although it is something that potentially has a, some beneficial, um, some characteristics to it, really is not something that we can use to diagnose heart failure in a patient. I can tell you a patient comes in elevated BNP, you really still have to look at your physical exam to determine do they really have uh, a heart failure exacerbation. On the flip side of that, your um, BNP can actually be inappropriately low as well. So BNP is actually metabolized by fat cells in the body. So obesity is a big thing that when patients have heart failure and are obese, they actually may not have elevated BNP levels. HFPEF patients also may not have elevated BNP levels. And this is because the BNP is released by stretching of that myocardium. And patients that have more of a restrictive physiology, which is more typical of the HFPEF population, are not going to release that BNP for it to be elevated um, in the labs. Um, right heart failure is another one. The right heart does not release as much BNP when it is stretched out as the left side of the heart. So I can tell you, I've had a patient that came to the emergency room, obese with HFPEF, clearly in volume overload, but their BNP was 50. And so I will tell you the emergency room was a little bit perplexed to how to manage that patient. And I said, please be sure to diurese them because they can't breathe. They have pulmonary congestion, JVP up to the earlobes, and a lot of low extremity edema. So really, this is where the labs maybe can help you out sometimes, but really you have to go back to your clinical assessment and what you feel from a physical exam and from a history standpoint is appropriate. Oh, those. Um, so the other thing that I think is really interesting is how do we manage these patients in a hospital setting um, in order to really try to make sure they have the best outcome? So you have a heart failure patient that comes in in this acute phase of being clinically decompensated, and you are doing everything you can to diurese this patient. You're going to work on, you know, acute, like high doses of IV diuretics, and we'll talk about exactly what dose in a second, and then you continue this strategy. And then at some point you decide, you know what, we've done a pretty decent job getting the majority of this fluid off. Let's try some oral diuretics in the hospital, let's try to see what we can do to optimize their oral medications in the hospital prior to discharge. And a big part of this is because whatever happens in the hospital, you're diuresing these people, and then you just kind of send them out and say, here are a bunch of pills, 
we've never tried them on you. Let's see how you do as an outpatient. A lot of times that's a really good way to set someone up for failure because now they've got all these new things. We've never tested them out. Each person responds very differently to these medications. And so by actually trialing these prior to discharge, you have a better idea, not only of how the patient responds, but on an outpatient basis, how should this medication be up titrated for this individual? How well did they tolerate any adjustments to that? And so you then discharge this patient, and we really wanna make sure these patients get early post-discharge follow-up. And that's a follow-up within seven to 10 days. And this is really big on trying to make sure patients have a smooth transition from the hospital to the home after they get that acute phase heart failure exacerbation taken care of. And then we can talk more about what is the chronic management. This is your chronic heart failure, slowly up titrating those goal-directed medical therapies um, and seeing how your patient does and potentially uh, looking at advanced options if that's necessary. So what is typically the main goal of heart failure admission? Well, it's always diuresis, right? And I really just had to add this because I just really like that picture. So that was the whole point of that slide. Um, and the biggest thing about diuresis is this concept of door to diuretic time. I think, you know, as cardiologists, we're really keen on having some algorithms in place. And unfortunately, there's no specific algorithm when it comes to time. But from a management standpoint, a patient that comes in decompensated, their first point of contact is the emergency room. And the better we are at getting that patient an appropriate dose of diuretic at that first point of contact, the better we will do at making sure that patient gets out of the hospital faster, which will also decrease the amount of hospital associated adverse events that take place and also give your patient a better prognosis overall. So what is an appropriate dose of diuretic? So here we can see a dose response curve for a heart failure patient and a normal patient. Patients with heart failure will require a larger dose of diuretic to have an equivalent response and their overall response is gonna be much lower than a typical patient on that maximum dose of diuretic. So for this reason, a patient with heart failure will, excuse me, will require these um, crazy doses. A lot of people think they're crazy. We think they're pretty normal, but doses of 200 of IV Lasix, possibly with a thiazide booster, because again, their ability to respond to those diuretic doses is much lower than would be considered typical for anybody else. So the dose trial, uh, which was actually, Grady was actually a part of this trial back in 2011, uh, was trying to help us decide, so what is that appropriate dose since these patients need such large doses? So the dose trial actually had four arms. It looked at continuous versus bolus dosing of diuretics, and it looked at low dose, which is the home dose of diuretic given in IV form, versus high dose, which is the home, two and a half times the home dose of diuretic given in IV form, but again, in bolus dosing excuse me, to figure out what was the appropriate way to diurese patients. And although there was no significant difference between continuous versus bolus dosing, it didn't matter if you gave it in bolus increments or if you gave it in a continuous infusion, where we did see benefit was in patients that received the high dose diuretic, and that's two and a half times their home dose of diuretic given in IV form. These patients had significant improvement in their dyspnea at 72 hours, had significant um, diuresis within 72 hours, which was also seen as a change in their weight within that 72 hour period. Now, they did have a slight increase in their creatinine also, and an increase in creatinine was an increase of 0.3 uh, mg per deciliter. Uh, that was considered significant. So these patients did have a slight increase in their creatinine. However, what we see is that really this permissive hypercreatinemia was not an issue and resolved over time. So in dose trial, they followed these patients over a 60 to 90 day period. This is the dose trial. This is actually in another study looking at the same thing. Um, but we found that over a 90 day follow-up period in the dose trial, the renal function actually came back down to normal. So getting these patients feeling better faster was key. And even though we did see a slight increase in that creatinine, that resolved over time. This is a different trial that actually looked at um, the use of ultrafiltration, this is the CARES trial. But even in this trial, even though there was an increase in creatinine over a period of time during the study period, over a 60-day follow-up, that creatinine actually resolved to less, to better than baseline um, at a two-month follow-up period. So this idea of permissive hypercreatinemia, so the bump in creatinine, the slight bump in creatinine, don't let that scare you when it comes to diuresing your patients, because diuresis is what they really need. So this is a, a trial that looked at patients and how well we diurese them and how they do overall. 
So patients that had worsening renal function plus no congestion, this is worsening renal function plus congestion, and no worsening, worsening renal function plus congestion. And what this is showing us is that patients that are discharged from the hospital still volume overloaded do not do well outpatient. Their mortality is significantly higher. As long as your patient is getting decongested, so they're being diuresed to what we believe is as euvolemic as possible prior to discharge, whether we get a slight bump in that creatinine, and remember, worsening renal function in this state is a creatinine increase of 0.3. So if they were 1.3, that's an increase to like 1.6 or so. That's considered significant. So it's okay to get increases in that creatinine as long as we are um, de diuresing our patients and really decongesting them. That's how we can make sure they have a better um, outcome. And same here, again, these patients are worsening renal function um, and this transient worsening renal function. So we have to make sure, again, as if patients are coming in, they already have these issues and maybe some renal dysfunction at baseline, this persistent renal function, worsening renal function is where there really are issues. As long as this appears to be transient, keep diuresing these patients, they will do better with less volume on board. So how do we manage these patients? Medically, right? So a big part of heart failure is really having this increase in your adrenergic system. You've got a lot of um, vasoconstriction, and that's what we're really working against to try to make sure we get good blood flow to the kidneys. We can make sure that they diurese appropriately. We have a lot of oral and IV vasodilators that can help us do that. And depending on your patient, you will decide which one is better. Now, why are vasodilators so important for heart failure patients? And a lot of times we worry about putting patients on vasodilators, especially the patients with lower uh, ejection fractions that come in with these, what we consider borderline pr blood pressures, like maybe a systolic of 100 to 110. So this is a uh, pressure volume um, relationship for patients with HEF-PEF. These are old nomenclatures, disregard please. Patients with HEF-PEF and patients with HEF-REF. So a patient with HEF-PEF, Typically, these patients we know tend to have a lot of heart, uh, excuse me, a lot of hypertension. And so as we put these patients on um, afterload reducers, we'll get a significant reduction in their blood pressure, and you might get some reduction in their LV volume as well. Now, if you take a patient with reduced ejection fraction, the slope for their uh, pressure volume relationship is much lower. It's not as steep. And so for these patients, we put them, as you can see here, this patient has a systolic of about 100 and 10, 105 or so, you put them on some afterload reducers and they don't get a huge drop in that systolic pressure. Right now they're probably running in the 90s or so, but they have a significant improvement in the LV volume. And that reduction in LV volume really helps to improve that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And that reduction in the wedge pressure is what helps them feel so much better. And what can even happen with the reduction in um, systemic vasoconstriction is you will see that the heart is actually able to pump out more blood. And so instead of a drop, you might even see their blood pressure maintain or actually go up a little bit because they've actually increased their cardiac output with that reduction in systemic vascular resistance. Um, so the big thing is this heart failure profiling. I'm sure you guys have all been versed about, especially if you've come to the heart failure clinic. This is a really good uh, way that we use to figure out what category is our heart failure patient in. Not every heart failure patient comes in decompensated. And so we can have patients that are warm and dry. That's kind of where we want everyone, right? They're perfusing really well, and that's the warm part, and they're dry, meaning they're not volume overloaded. We can have the warm and wet state, which is where patients may be perfusing very well, but they need a lot of diuresis. In this state, we might consider, you know, they just need a little bit of afterload reduction, just a lot of diuresis really to help with that state. We have the cold and dry state, which is probably one of the worst and the ones that we typically see in the transplant world. And these are patients that are in horrible cardiogenic shock, but also euvolemic. So all of their symptoms are based on the fact that they just have a horrible pump. Um, the cold and wet is the one that you guys probably see most often when you round on service on the cardiology service anyway. And these are patients that are not perfusing well, uh, but are very volume overloaded. And this typically accounts for about 5% of the heart failure uh, population overall. So typically you won't see these patients if you're on uh, the medicine service or hopefully not on the cardiology service, uh, but definitely when you're rounding on the heart failure service. And so again, these cold and wet patients account for about 5% of heart failure admissions. Um, and it really is a sign of poor perfusion and just being very volume overloaded. And this is when we start considering what we think of as more advanced 
um, management strategies for heart failure. And so initially we start with using our inotropes, which are dobutamine and milrinone, our two um, initial ways of trying to manage some of these patients. We then have to start thinking about what is some mechanical support, especially when those strategies don't seem to work. So we've got the balloon pump, which can help a little bit and is really a way we manage some patients for a short period of time initially um, for transplant sometimes, and it augments blood flow just enough, about half a liter per minute. Um, we have the impella, which can actually augment blood flow up to three and a half liters per minute, uh, excuse me, up to five liters per minute, depending on the size of the pump that you use. It's actually considered a mini, a mini LVAD, if you will, because it actually sits in the left ventricle. We actually have a right-sided impella as well that helps when patients are having issues with RV failure for various reasons. And uh, to keep going up, and again, we decide what strategy we need to use based on how well is our patient responding to the amount of mechanical support we use. So this is a BIVAD system. With this, we actually provide uh, extensive mechanical support, about 10 liters per minute. And it can provide both right and left-sided support, or we can actually change the cannulation to only provide support for one of the sides needed. And this is really good if we're trying to move someone towards a more durable uh, ventricular support uh, sort of uh, idea to see how well is the right side going to function uh, as long as the left side is supported. So that's something we can use for those patients. And that's, again, looking at the cannulation methods. ECMO is really the last resort, really, if um, we have patients that are just not doing well from an oxygenation and from a cardiac output standpoint, regardless of what we've tried, we really need to get that blood flowing. And with this, we can provide both oxygenation and, uh, and cardiac output support. It really takes over the function of the heart and the lungs, it's bypass. And so this is something that we kind of use at the end, if need be, uh, to help support some of our patients. And really, these are just things that I thought would be kind of interesting for you guys uh, to, to look at. And with this, I think, Dr. Wilson, do you wanna finish with this slide? So we can handle some questions here at, at EUH, uh, but we may lose our satellites. Is that the point we should say? And this is just a final slide. And I abstracted this from uh, diabetes uh, care, which annually comes up with uh, guidelines and they're getting closer in sync uh, with the ACC and the AHA guidelines, but they come out every year. And most of this uh, we actually covered. So any questions, uh, anybody here? If we can get them from the other sites, that'd be great. Waiting on questions from the other sites right now. One question I had is the DAPA HF trial is just very interesting to a lot of us, especially for those and don't have who don't have diabetes. Do we think it works because it's a mild diuretic, or is there another effect with glucose, or is there something I didn't else? Hear it, did you? DAPA HF. Why is it diuretic? <laughs> We're gonna put uh, Doctor. <laughs> so there's actually a thought that there may actually be some sort of an effect that it plays in improving cardiac efficiency, actually, um, with the mild ketosis that it may cause. So it's not just the diuresis itself, because diuretics, you know, are, again, like we saw, aren't always great for the kidneys as it is, but DAPA-HF actually shows, and other trials have shown, that the glyphosones actually do support the kidneys a little bit better. And so the thought is that aside from the diuresis, there's actually this mild ketosis that may in some way increase cardiac efficiency. And that's why we're seeing the benefit in all comers. I think I'm getting the nod from Dr. Stevens to end. So thank you very much. <laughs>